Thank you very much, Michael, for that kind introduction. Uh, and also thank you very much to John Innes and Sue Watts and the uh, Faculty of Forestry for inviting me here to get the opportunity to give this seminar, which I'm delighted to do. And also thank you to the Faculty of uh, Population and Public Health uh, for hosting me here. So uh, I'm actually, yes, Matilda van den Bosch, though I keep the old name Anestet because I started publishing in that name. So that's why, uh, is this a remote, yeah. Right, uh, as Michael said, I used to work as a physician in uh, first general practice and then in radiology. And then somewhere along the line, uh, I realized to take my interest in the environmental issues and also opportunities seriously. So that's when I started to knock on the door to the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences um, because I happen to believe that we are impacted as human beings and not the least our health by the environment we live in, both the social and the physical environment. So I guess I tried to, to swap from using these lifestyle related disease killers to another kind of uh, medication which we could call uh, the pill of salutogen, uh, which is kind of nature in a pill. And that does not exist, of course, and neither does the lifestyle related disease killers exist. But the, um, that's a little bit what I wanted to talk about today that I believe, or it is like that, that the kind of diseases we suffer from today, mostly globally, internationally, are not perhaps not suitable for treating with medications like pharmaceuticals and surgery and whatever. Um, why you could try and make it a bit easier. This is just a picture, of course, to kind of show in a very simple way how nature may affect our health. And this is not a very new thought, and it could even be that today I will just break in a few open doors for you. I think you are pretty aware of the things. And I mean, even Hippocrates, the old father of medicine, used gardens in his care of the patients. And uh, Voltaire, the French philosopher, uh, said that the art of medicine is, consists in amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. Uh, so it's pretty simple. And one can wonder why we need to do research about this. Uh, but as you know, in order to have some kind of impact, in order to use these things, uh, we need evidence and we need data and empirical uh, research to show, show what we actually mean and to show what we can do. Because I think that uh, somewhere along this line, uh, we lost a little bit in the medical establishment. We lost a little bit the feel for how we are in, in influenced by the environment around us and how we can use nature and green environments as a health resource. Uh, the, the old sanatoriums and the old mental hospitals were usually set in beautiful landscapes, kind of using this uh, intrinsic belief or the thought that nature could be used as a, maybe not as a healing environment, but rather as uh, promoting the recovery of the patients uh, staying there. And for the sanatoriums, obviously the fresh air, etc. Somewhere we lost these wis this wisdom or this uh, common sense, I would call it. And this is one of the psychiatric clinics of Stockholm, which is quite to me, I, I, it appears pretty harsh to me and not very suitable, I would say, for, for recovery. And this is the psychiatric clinic of Pittsburgh. It's neither, it doesn't make sense, uh, I think. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost hostile. And it's the same with the, in the, at the University Hospital of Lund, where I used to work in radiology. It's, it's pretty similar to this one. It's a big bunker, and, and you get kind of a feeling of anxiety, even by entering the and all this also can sound a little bit fluffy sometimes, and that is the, the problem I face when I talk to my old colleagues, that it's all a little bit fluffy, and yes, it's nice with flowers and trees, but what we do in here is really important uh, pharmaceutical stuff, and we know what we have, and we have objective data on that. And that is also one of the reasons for me to, to work as a researcher on these common sense issues. What I would like to talk about today is obviously health and public health and how I see it in, in, in uh, how it works together in the biological and environmental systems. Um, so we have the environment which affects the behavior of us human beings and also the behavior of us affects the 
environment, as we know with climate change and environmental degradation, uh, our behavior does affect how the environment uh, is sustainable or not. We also know that the environment directly affects the brain function because the brain is not a, a set system, but it's, it's plastic and can change uh, depending on the environment. And there is quite some research on enriched environments. There's still just mice and rat studies, but where you look at uh, how you can enrich the environment and how that's influenced the behavior of the rats and uh, where they become the, the cognitive skills of the rat brains increase with a certain enrichment of the environment. Then we know that the brain functions are affected by our behavior. For example, if we are physically active, we get higher cognitive skills. And the stress functions or the stress reactions rather in the brain does affect how we behave. And altogether, in the middle, we get health, hopefully, or we get disease. Um, something that I also think is a little bit overlooked today in uh, healthcare, at least in Sweden and in Europe, is uh, how the behavior, actually the behavior of people, does affect very much how we feel and the health status of a country. 50% of, uh, of the diseases are explained by our behaviors. Uh, the environment plays a role and the genetics plays a role. And only medical care takes care of 10% of changing between health and disease and curing patients. This is interesting in the perspective of how we fund the research. 90% of the funding, the financial funding for, for health research uh, is directed towards 10% of the diseases we actually suffer from. We have a completely different scenario today than we had, uh, say, like 100 years ago when there was a completely different disease scenario than we have today. And then obviously, probably this made more sense then to, to, to look at uh, um, these kinds of, of uh, interventions to, to treat diseases. But it doesn't really make sense today anymore. This is a picture of the global burden of disease, one of the estimates that the World Health Organization uh, makes uh, with regular updates. And this is from 2004. They have an update also from 2010, I think. Uh, however, this is uh, a few years ago. But they predict what will happen in the world by 2030. And you can see that in 2004, uh, there were still infectious diseases that were dominating the global burden. Uh, the global burden of disease, um, which then you can't really treat infections to a high extent with the environment and, and interventions in the society, rather than you need uh, pharmaceuticals. However, you can see a pretty steep decline in the burden of the infectious diseases coming in 2030, where instead the depressive disorders, mental disorders, will dominate globally. And that is the interesting thing, because um, at least in Sweden and the Western world, in Europe, uh, we consider sometimes that these issues are not hardcore. The mental disorders is something that people tend to make up, and we should get ourselves together and get out to work again. Um, <clears throat> and then it's interesting to know that it, this is actually a problem that we face all over the world. Uh, south of Sahara, we are still uh, it is still a dominating burden uh, by infectious diseases today. In the rest of the world today, already, it is these lifestyle-related diseases, the non-communicable diseases, NCDs. Um, like in India, for example, I think the most common, uh, the, the most common death uh, reason, reason for mortality in young men between 15 and 44 years old is suicide. And in Europe, suicide is a more common reason for death than, uh, than violence and war and traffic accidents. So it's, it's a little bit hard, I feel, to ignore these problems. And it's a little bit hard to believe that we can uh, have a bigger impact on these diseases by, by using medicaments and pharmaceuticals, etc. Rather, I believe in, as is, of course, the concept, that's what I say, I might be breaking in uh, open doors here, but I believe, of course, in prevention and even more to, to prevent people to get disease, uh, diseases at all, to, to prevent them from coming to the hospitals, to promote health. And to, one way of doing this is uh, by creating healthy environments where people can stay healthy and avoid uh, mental disorders and also the ischemic heart diseases and uh, obstructive lung disorders, uh, obesity, etc.
Uh, yes, this is just another picture of the same thing, more or less, uh, uh, but it's quite a short time span, span. only 20, 20 years between 1990 and 2010, where there's a big increase uh, uh, in the non-communicable diseases, uh, which I think we need to, to face quite much more in. I think I'm also pretty uh, um, colored by the fact that I used to work in, in the hospital where where uh, those things are not really considered enough, uh, to my opinion. There, when I go back to my old colleagues and talk about what I do today, they kind of mm, shake their heads and think I'm a little bit crazy. They, they still don't know about this, actually, and that is why I think it's important to talk about it, and uh, not to you, maybe. It's not that important, because I'm sure you all know about this, but um, still something to stress. So, as you know, the non-communicable diseases consist mainly of dis diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, obesity and chronic respiratory diseases, cancer, and also mental disorders. Mental disorders are not officially mm, listed under those non-communicable diseases, but within WHO, those are considered as NCDs. Uh, simply, they are not transmitted um, from, from person to person. It's not contagious. And um, this is another um, demonstration of uh, the, 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 the big problem of today. The NCDs will cost $21 trillion over the next two decades. And the, the good thing is that 80% of those could be, could be avoided, could be prevented by different measures. I will today talk about one factor, which is uh, the environment. Of course, there are loads of other things we can do to prevent diseases, and I'm not saying that green environments are the silver bullet, it's the solution to all the problems of the world. It happens to be the little tiny factor that I'm working with, and that is where I have my main interest, but we are all aware that there are many different things that need to be changed in the society and in our world to make people more healthy. The reason also for bringing this up is that, as you know, in public health there is uh, these diseases are dominating, they have a huge burden on the society. So therefore, even if only the, the effect size of every single little intervention we can do still has a pretty large impact uh, on the whole population. So, uh, the risk factors for non-communicable diseases that I will address today is the chronic stress, which uh, causes many, uh, is a risk factor for many of the NCDs. Physical inactivity and sedentary uh, lifestyles and socioeconomic inequalities. Uh, all these three are important risk factors for the NCDs and those are also possible to address by creating healthy environments and uh, I will talk about this today. So, as we know, one of the risk factors is stress, and uh, we also, just a very brief repetition of the um, endocrinological and neurophysiological uh, cortisol uh, cascade. The, the brain gets affected, and the hypothalamus uh, decreases uh, <laughs> releases corticotropine releasing hormone to affect the pituitary. And uh, that, in turn, affects the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. And the factors that affect the hypothalamus can come from very many things, and uh, like, for example, family relationships and stressful life situations like exams or economical problems, etc. And what, what differs today, of course, from when we were evolutionary adapted to the biological systems that our bodies have is that there is a risk for these factors to become chronic. It's not that we are attacked by a predator and which then uh, uh, starts this physiological processes, but it's more like, I mean, if we have economical problems or we have exams coming one after the other, then these stress reactions continue to affect our bodies in, uh, in a negative way. Uh, because the old reactions, those that we have uh, physiologically, biologically speaking, is the fight or flight reactions. And those are pretty uh, suitable if, if there is a predator uh, hunting us and we can fight the lion or we can flee up to a tree. But it doesn't help to fight the computer or whatever it is that causes our stress. So then instead we need to have something that is called coping strategies. 
For example, physical activity or going out to nature. If you don't cope, you get these issues with uh, an overloading burden of stress and we start getting less and less cognitive because it's, that is what's happening in the brain if you are stressed. Uh, certain functions in the brain stop, uh, you get too much inputs on the primitive parts of the brain that then are, are transferring this input to the amygdala and the, the uh, uh, limbic system in the middle of the brain, which then in turn is supposed to transfer a reasonable amount of information to the, to the cognitive, the frontal lobes of the brain. And if this system is overloaded, we get too much information to the frontal lobes, which then uh, cannot really sort um, and cannot work reasonably, which is why then the primitive parts of the brain start taking over and we, we become kind of aggressive and we are not that good in taking good uh, decisions. And I don't know, but I can recognize that a little bit with myself. If I am very stressed, I'm not the most reasonable person and I don't take the most rational decisions. Um, so that is where we might use nature green environments. Nature in all its form. I mean, nature is a big term and I can't say that I can define it perfectly. It could be blue environments, it could be green environments, it could be parks or big forests, wildlife, it could be mountains, it could be Vancouver. <laughs> um, well, I think for me, for me, I would say, I cannot say, as I said, I cannot say that mountains are better than forests, but, uh, and this is still to be studied more, I think. For me, I see it as a concept, I see it as a big whole, uh, big entity of uh, nature. I think if you try and picture it yourself within your minds, you can get a picture of what nature means to you. And I think that that picture is the definition of nature. Anyhow, stress, as I said, is a main risk factor for many disorders. It's a main risk factor. It does contribute to mental health disorders. It also contributes, it's also a risk factor to many others of the NCDs. As we saw before, as we know, the mental health disorders, mental diseases have a big impact on the global burden of disease, which of course uh, brings lots of public health issues and costs for the society and the healthcare systems. Therefore, I don't say that nature directly has an impact on, on public health issues. It's not, it does go, for example, through decrease of the stress reactions, which, as you can see, if we get less, uh, if nature can contribute to less stress, we get less of these issues on the right side for you. I will just mention this study because it is, uh, kind of groundbreaking study published in 1984 in Science by Roger Ulrich. It has a few flaws and, and um, you can criticize it, but it is groundbreaking and that is why I mention it. Roger Ulrich found in a retrospective study that uh, looking at patients that were recovering after gallbladder surgery, those patients, uh, they were all, all um, treated at the same hospitals, but half of them had a view from their room to a, a green park, and the other half had a view through the window to a brick wall. And what he found was that those who had a view to the park from their window, they had a, a quicker recovery, they needed uh, not less strong pills, uh, uh, analgetics, and they uh, had a better emotional well-being as reported by the nurses. Um, so this is just a table showing this. The analgetic strength of the, of the uh, pills they got was they, they needed not so much of the strong pills. It was much higher uh, odds for the wall patients, the brick wall patients, while they could uh, recover well with only the use of weaker analgetics. This is a, a much more recent study published by Jenny Rowe and her colleagues in UK 2013, where they have been looking at cortisol, uh, mainly I think this study is also in uh, socioeconomically deprived societies, uh, parts of cities which they have been looking at. And as you know, the cortisol uh, is not that interesting. The absolute um, 
estimates absolute values, but it's the slope. The, the circadian rhythm of the cortisol uh, shall have a healthy slope, a healthy rhythm. And as you can see, those people, those women, and it's the same for both men and women here, they, those women that live in areas with a high level of high green space, they get a much steeper or much significantly steeper slope of the cortisol decrease after the morning hours when the cortisol is high. It's less steep for both men and women, women and men, uh, which indicates there is something in the green environment that may buffer the stressful lives uh, of the people. As Michael mentioned, I've been working both with epidemiological studies, but also a little bit with experimental studies, trying to figure out a little bit more about why we have these health impacts of green environment. And then I have collaborated with the university in Lund at the engineering department, where they have a virtual reality laboratory. It's a cave which you enter and you get immersed in a completely digital virtual world. And, um, you have this three-dimensional uh, perspective and you can also kind of walk around in the environment and you feel that you walk around trees and you get a high level of interaction feeling within this environment. There we have developed a, a virtual stress test. The three year social stress test, which I'm sure you are familiar with, is among the most validated, among the most used research stress tests when studying, studying stress. Obviously, you need to have your patients or your participants, the test participants, stressed in order to be able to study it. And the um, three-year TSST uh, consists of a short, the participant is supposed to give a short presentation of themselves for five minutes to a committee of three persons, and uh, then they get also an arithmetic task. Usually in this test you have three real persons, like a committee of, of actors, usually you hire three actors that sit like this and you see the participant gives a presentation of herself and the, the task is to, to give a presentation where you're actually applying for a job that you wish to, to, uh, to have. And the thing is to make this situation even more stressful than just presenting yourself, which can be uh, stressful in itself, is that these uh, actors are told to not give very much emotional feedback. And actually, if you talk to someone and with, if they don't really reply within 30 seconds, you start getting a little, little bit nervous and you, 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 you get an even higher heartbeat than you might have had before and you start sweating and yes. The, the biomarkers of stress increase, you get higher cortisol and, and the ECG uh, patterns change, etc., in accordance with the normal physiological stress reaction. And uh, so it's mostly this that the emotional feedback is not very normal, which makes you stressed. Anyhow, we made this situation in a virtual version, which is good because you can completely standardize it so you know that the stress reactions doesn't depend on what kind of actors you have. And of course, it's much cheaper, so we can run these stress tests many, many times without much costs. And uh, of course, the interesting thing is that we get almost the same reactions as in the real version of the three-year social stress test, which is kind of ridiculous, or it's, I mean, we, we are a little bit stupid to, to react stressful to, to, a, to a committee of completely digitalized, completely virtual persons. But we, we thought it, w it was painful also for us as research leaders to see these participants getting very nervous and stressed. And I mean, a few of them even, even they couldn't continue. And, and we used uh, young, healthy males, as I, <laughs> as I so searched for in, in, uh, during the study. Uh, so they were all kind of students there at the Department of Engineering and, and were not that prone to getting very stressed otherwise. Anyhow, after this five minutes presentation of the cells, uh, they get an arithmetic task by this, the most evil of the three guys. Uh, so he tells them that now you shall calculate from 1671 in steps of 13 down to zero. And if you make a mistake, we'll tell you and you have to start over again. There's none of those guys uh, who has managed to get down to zero and a few of them even stop at 1671 and just continue stumbling. And uh, they can't calculate what that is uh, to, to draw away 13 from that. Anyhow, so 
then we have that and we know that they are pretty stressed, which we measured with cortisol and the ECG and the breathing rhythm, etc. After that, the lucky guys end up in a virtual reality uh, nature environment. And this is a forest and we take them on a virtual walk there. And again, it's completely standardized. So all the participants uh, experience exactly the same uh, green environment. One group experienced this environment, one group experienced this exactly the same green environment, though with natural sounds as well. So it was twittering birds and murmur of water and uh, quite a nice experience. Obviously, this one is more realistic than this one, which is a very high real realism in the visual impression. You cannot at all experience it here, of course, because it's two dimensional, but hopefully a little bit of a picture of what it's like there in the laboratory and a control condition. Uh, so, as I said, we measured cortisol and also ECG. So we saw in the high frequency heart rate variability, a uh, significant response, uh, which, as you know, the heart rate variability is to, supposed to be uh, not too low. Uh, you should have a certain variability in your heart rate. And uh, the guys that were recovering in the most realistic natural environment, uh, VR nature plus sound, they had a quicker recovery in their heart rate variability. They all had a uh, pretty small one here, and then there was no difference, no significant difference between the control condition and the VR nature and no sound. One can discuss and speculate about why there was no effect at all. The, our hypothesis was, of course, that this group, the VR nature without any sound, would be at least in the middle here, that it could have, would have a little bit effect with uh, just the visual impression of nature. But many of those guys in this group with the VR nature and no sound uh, expressed was that it was almost a bit scary to be in this visual realistically uh, realistic environment, but with no other sensory dimensions. So they thought that since we had been so evil before, probably a troll or a monster would pop out of the forest and scare them again. So they were a little bit alert, while those could obviously relax a little bit better. Yes. There is a limitation in this study that we don't have any groups with only sound. We are collecting data for that at this very moment, I hope. Oh, yes, we are. And we almost finished with that data collection. Mm. Yeah. This is just small pilot studies, but it will uh, hopefully help us to get a little bit closer to the empirical data that we, the, the evidence that we need in order to be able to use these things in a wider scale and in order to explain the results that we get from epidemiological studies. We are also now collecting data on, on not only these twittering birds, but also uh, uh, thunder and, and sounds of rain, etc. Obviously, only the sound exposure as well to see what the very sound, uh, what impact that can have on the reactions. Uh, green environments, it has been claimed that those can help in cities to decrease the, the levels of noise. It's, uh, it's uh, not completely consistent, the findings from that. But uh, what seems to be true, though, which has been shown in a few studies by among others, Skidlöf and Gunnarsson and Erström in Sweden, is that the perception of noise is, even if it's not, I mean, if you measure, measure decibel levels, it might not be a big difference. The perception of noise decreases uh, by access to green environments. This is shown in this study that was published in 2007, where you can see that people, if they're asked about if, whether noise is a problem, uh, if you have poorer access to green environments, you claim that it's, it's a bigger problem, significantly big, bigger problem than if you have better access. And this is just another, they are not going outdoors because of the noise. And there is again a higher level of people uh, staying inside because of the noise they experience in their environments. Um, Urbanization and stress is something we know about. There are loads of, of uh, good uh, things with living in cities. You get many amenities and access to healthcare and cultural uh, facilities, etc. But it also has a few negative impacts, as we know. Uh, like, for example, mental disorders like schizophrenia and depression is more common uh, in cities as compared to the, to the countryside. Uh, it has been shown in several bigger epidemiological uh, studies. 
this uh, a group in, in Germany, uh, Lederbogen and his colleagues, found this intriguing and wanted to find again some, some uh, experimental evidence for why or explanations for why this might be so. Uh, they, uh, this is a very well performed study, I think. Uh, it was published in 2011 in Nature. They kind of ran the experiment back and forth and in every possible way, I would say, and they looked at different populations. One part of the population were from the cities, they had grown up in the cities or were currently living in the city and the other part had either been uh, brought up on the countryside or were currently living in the countryside. And they were also exposed to the same stress test, the three-year social stress test, and then they looked at what happened in the brains with uh, fMRI, functional magnetic uh, resonance tomography, uh, imaging. <laughs> Uh, and what they could find then was that this little uh, structure in the limbic system of the brain, the amygdala, was firing up uh, to a higher extent in the city population as compared to the rural uh, in both occasions here. And this indicates, this very structure indicates that they have a, a higher proneness to react to stress and they can't cope, if we express it like that, as good with stress as you can. Uh, if you don't get this firing up of the amygdala structure. And I don't say that the countryside people all live in the beautiful forest. Uh, there are different kinds of, uh, of uh, countrysides. And, uh, but I'm mostly saying that yes, environment does matter for how we feel and that can also be shown with uh, hardcore uh, measurements like fMRI. It seems to be better to live here in the Swedish countryside for the mental health. Uh, a recently published study by a research group at Exeter University, Ian Alcock and his colleagues uh, had access to pretty good uh, data material. It was a longitudinal panel data study looking at uh, the health status of the, the British population. And they then correlated this to geographical data and looked at what happened if you had moved to greener areas or had moved to less green areas. And as you can see, a pretty, a pretty immediate significant increase uh, in the general health uh, questionnaire and uh, which measures mental health and uh, it remains high it's, you get a sustained a sustained uh, reaction in terms of better mental health as compared to when you move to a less green area when you get a decrease in your mental health status though it recovers after a while uh, I was visiting there at Exeter University when they were performing the, the analysis of this data and, and they had looked, of course, I mean, the studies I present are all controlled for different kinds of confounders, etc. So uh, these are what comes out. This is what uh, is a factor that is indeed, uh, or as far as we can know from controlling, it does have a significant impact. And I have one of the other factors they controlled for was getting children and getting married, etc. And I can tell you that the worst thing you can do is getting children. Then, uh, you <laughs> then your health, mental health decrease and it remains low. I was a little bit, of course, um, surprised by this because I've been happy to get children. Um, but after a while, you know, you, you, you do get worried, you do get continuous anxiety for what happens to your kids, etc., which might explain then why your mental health, as measured with GHQ at least, uh, decreased by that factor. I will not say anything about getting married. A <laughs> uh, second risk factor that I mentioned after stress is physical inactivity, and we all know that this is an increasing problem in the world today. And Canada is, of course, scoring pretty well. Uh, yeah, you can see it also. The colors are different on my slide. You are even scoring better than the fabulous Scandinavia, Sweden. And you score definitely better than UK, which has, um, for some reason, a, a terrible problem with their population being very sedentary today. They are at the level, at the level of, same level as, uh, as the Saudi Arabia, which is, which is a very <laughs> sedentary country, if to say like that. And uh, these problems increase. Uh, for example, in UK, as I said, 17% uh, of the deaths are caused by inactivity. Again, this could obviously be prevented by getting people more active. 
As we know, that is easier said than done. Uh, it's, we have in Sweden, for example, you can as a doctor prescribe physical activity, and that's one good thing to do. But um, looking at behavioral studies again, there are many things that we need to do in order to change people's behavior, something that interests me quite much, um, because it can be implied at different levels, of course, at health behavior, which, as we know, is a very important factor for, for affecting health status in a country. And you can see physical inactivity uh, is a risk factor for not only obesity, obesity, but also diabetes and cancer and all cause mortality. This is just a picture, a diagram of the increase in, in obesity that we all know about since the 70s. We have, uh, uh, this is the state, yeah, NH, NAS data, an increase in, in uh, obesity. A Canadian study found that people who spend more time sitting are at a high risk for mortality, again, from all causes. So you have like 1.5 higher odds for, for uh, for um, increase in all-cause mortality by being sedentary. So what does nature have to do with this? Well, a few studies has demonstrated that access to green areas, this is mostly studied in urban areas, access to urban green areas increase the levels of physical activity in a population. And yeah, again, you get an indirect uh, effect on the um, NCDs and the global burden of disease and the public health issues as a whole by providing access to natural green areas in the cities. This is a relatively old study, but it was published in the British Medical Journal in 2005, and you can see that access to, I think this, yes, this was made on children. The odds ratios for being physically active is significantly higher if you have a high access to green areas. The effect, the direct effect on obesity is not that high. So, uh, these are just a little bit more. Well, this is from 2006 by Cohen and her colleagues um, that showed that among girls, adolescent girls, public parks and physical activity access increases the levels of physical activity. And another one is also about parks. It's a, it's a randomized controlled trial showing again the same thing. And uh, then trying to define what is the best dose. And you talk about green exercise, where it's, you're looking for the synergy effect between access to green areas and physical activity, which are then supposed to be uh, beneficial to health, both of them. And this was published in 2010, and again, showing the same thing, that access to, to green areas seem to increase the levels of physical activity. We uh, made a systematic review, which uh, a, report, a report for the IFPRA, uh, where we collected the data from different studies, and we could show in this one uh, that the levels of physical activity, again, there is a high level of evidence for this, and also a high level of evidence for decreased obesity for urban parks. This was specifically defined, the green areas. Finally, the socioeconomic inequalities is a major issue that WHO is working with pretty much. Uh, that is a reason for, 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 for many of the public health actions that we need to focus on today. Uh, we know, of course, that socioeconomic inequalities contribute to inequalities in health, and that this could be explained or is explained by lower levels of education, lower uh, economic uh, facilities, etc. Uh, however, there is a disproportion, disproportionate, uh, dispropor disproportional uh, higher level of uh, ill health in the socioeconomically deprived people, uh, th which is not explained by education and finances and uh, social capital, etc. And uh, this is something that we need to study uh, because, of course, we need to do whatever we can, if, if healthy environments is the tiny little way to increase the health in this population, it's something we should definitely do. This is a picture of, of Vancouver, and I'm sure you know about this, that the eastern parts of the city uh, are more deprived than the western parts where we are. Uh, it's, it's a pretty clear cut here. And this is where we might have to focus on increasing the opportunities for better health. 
This was just a guy that was surfing around on Google Earth and he could define uh, actually uh, income inequalities just by looking down uh, from above. So these are more wealthy areas and those are more deprived areas. Of course there is a selection effect so that people who are more wealthy can afford living in these areas where it's more green while these areas are cheaper. However, I think that from a so societal perspective uh, we could actually uh, plan for more green in these areas to at least do something about that little factor which might help to increase the levels of health in those areas. Uh, a pretty well-known study that was published in The Lancet in 2008 by Mitchell and Popham uh, demonstrated on a large UK British population that something with green environments seem to, to buffer the health inequalities depending on socioeconomic inequalities. Uh, and you can see that uh, living in a green area does not have a big impact on the health uh, issues for a wealthy population. However, for if, uh, a less wealthy population, it has a high impact. So this is the gap, the health gap between, between um, wealthy populations and less wealthy populations. And this gap decreases quite a lot by increasing the levels of green in, uh, in the areas where the people live and play and work. Um, this is a uh, transactional study. So again, we don't know enough about the cause and effect, but it indicates that we need to study more on these things. It has also been uh, suggested that trees uh, can have an effect on the social capital of, uh, of a population and the tree crime reduction and less violence in areas with more trees, uh, if those are planned in a good way. And also the emerald ash borer disease, um, they made a before and after study on that and found that after the, the trees were lined with dead trees instead of these green trees, you got higher levels of cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases. Yeah, this is just another list of health benefits from green areas that has been suggested in different studies. ADHD among children, uh, there are several studies, I just mentioned one, but there are several studies showing that if you bring uh, the kids with ADHD symptoms to green areas, they seem to be able to concentrate better, they, their cognitive abilities and capacities increase with living in, in green, by being exposed to green. Also pregnancy outcomes um, has been published here, a uh, study on this recently showing some good effects of green areas. And uh, megacities, the mortality, all-cause mortality is decreasing. And uh, recently studies from Europe, uh, one, of the, one of the EU funded projects has published quite a lot on these things recently. Cardiovascular and lower respiratory diseases and all-cause mortality, etc. Finally, we also have the ecosystem services, which obviously has an impact on health, like reduced urban heat island, for example. People die <laughs> by increased heat in the cities, and if we can reduce those, we can obviously reduce the mortality levels. Yeah, do we need doctors? This is something I, I, I sometimes ask my former colleagues, because this is a report, this is also one of the WHO um, projects where they look at uh, health inequalities in, in cities all over the world. And it's called the Hidden Cities, and they are doing an update at that uh, at the moment. Anyhow, a role for all. Who can do what? This is a big report where they are looking at different factors that, that uh, affect the health inequalities of populations. And in the end, they make a summary about who can do what. And they talk about local governments, civil society, urban planners, researchers, international agencies. But nowhere you can see the medical professionals, which is a little bit interesting, I think. So why is this so? That is something that interests me, of course. What time is it? Uh, I have a little bit of time left. Um, well, there are different theories on this. The biophilia, that we have an innate love for nature, or it's evolutionary theories that we are uh, prone to adapt it to living in natural areas, why we are then getting less stress there. And the attention theory, that um, there is enough, or just 
the correct amount, a good, enough, a good amount of, of information in nature which makes us uh, recover in a good way. And that can also be explained by biological mechanisms. I'm not going through all these theories because it will take some time. Mm. One of the things I would like to mention briefly though is the, the a little bit of research has been done on the patterns of nature and the, particularly the patterns of fractals and, and fractals is a mathematically de explained or defined uh, pattern which simply means that you have similar patterns repeating themselves in different scales. And it has turned out that if you put natural patterns like trees, flowers, etc., into the computer, you get a fractal pattern out of it. It's called a natural fractal because, of course, it's not, it's not uh, statistically absolutely uh, a fractal, though it's, it's this random effect which seems to have a certain impact as well. And at the very fractal dimension of 1.3, uh, if you look at, at uh, uh, digitally constructed fractals, something seems to happen in the brain uh, which has been measured with EEG and uh, this happens to be the perfect dimension of the natural fractals which you find in trees and flowers etc. And you experience a certain level of tranquility and uh, when you look at preference studies people tend to prefer fractal patterns around 1.3. Uh, this would again be some kind of a mechanistic explanation for why we are feeling well in nature. A couple of studies are, are published on this and another one is on its way. Just another picture of fractals. You can see it's, it's pretty neat I think from those very small little uh, flower bunches here to the bigger one to the larger plant and this goes in several levels of course. It repeats itself and if you start looking at those you, you see fractals everywhere so Okay, I'm pretty fanatic about it at the moment. You can see it in, in mountains and coastlines and clouds and trees, obviously. Uh, they are everywhere, but not in the built environments. Hmm. Another hardcore study on this thing was made by an English research group in, and published in 2010. There they had taken advantage of the fact that the sound of a highway at a certain distance is very, very similar to the sound of, of uh, waves breaking towards the shore at a certain distance. This is demonstrated by these curves where you have the freeway curve here and the uh, beach decibel curve here. And you see they follow each other pretty neatly. Uh, what they made was to take an average of these two sounds and put them together to one identical sound curve. Um, which then could resemble either a highway or a beach. They had two groups of people and one group were watching these pictures of a highway, listening to this average sound. The other group were looking at pictures of the beach, listening to exactly the same sound. Obviously, they got they, those were studied with fMRI again, and obviously those, they got uh, activation on both the visual center and the auditory center. However, in the group which, who thought, of course, that they listened to the sounds of nature, the beach group, they also got an activation of the frontal lobes, the parts that kind of uh, expresses feelings of tranquility. And most importantly, they got a higher connectivity in the brain, the networking in the brain increased in this beach group. In the other group, you only got activation in the two other uh, parts areas of the brain. Uh, a recent uh, hypothesis has been suggested by Graham Rook and he, uh, his theory is that the way we live today we are not exposed to enough uh, microbes uh, which explains the, the increase in autoimmune diseases of today. That the immune system is not triggered enough, it's not getting enough data from start to to develop the way it's supposed to do, uh, to adapt to the uh, environments we hereafter live. So, of course, as infants, we get exposed to many different uh, bacteria and viruses and microbes, which triggers our immune system to develop. However, we don't get enough from the natural environment with the spores and organisms of soil and plants, etc., which could explain uh, why we don't develop good enough immune systems. So what can we do with this uh, knowledge, these indications that green environments could be good for us? Healthy cities for healthy people, how do we create that in reality? Mm. 
And there I am uh, involved in a project with WHO in Europe uh, where they are working on following up on monitoring uh, the Palmer commitments which were uh, signed in 2010. In the Palmer commitments, among many other commitments, they say that we aim to provide each child by 2020 with access to healthy and safe environments and settings of daily life in which they can walk and cycle to kindergartens and schools and to green spaces in which to play and undertake physical activity. This is pretty remarkable, actually, that WHO picks this thing up in 2010, that green spaces could have a uh, good enough impact on health to actually include it in the PARMA commitments. So, in order to monitor this and to see that the countries live up to the commitments they have signed, you need an indicator, which we developed by using very simple uh, measurements, simply uh, measuring access to public green and op uh, open spaces where you look at the proportion of a city's population that has access to a green area of a certain size within a certain uh, distance. And we use for that population distribution data and GIS data, geographic information system data. We used in this because, again, it is Europe. This is the European uh, WHO. So we use land use data from Urban Atlas, which covers the EU cities of Europe. But they, they have a pretty good categorization of different parts, different land use in, in uh, the GIS database of Urban Atlas. We looked then at the green, the little uh, category of green urban areas, 1.4.1. One. Uh, one could consider a few other uh, categories as well, but we in the end, after having made a few uh, analyses, we decided to use the green urban areas. And those include most green urban areas, but not cemeteries and not private gardens uh, and things like that. So yeah, just a brief picture of the GIS analysis, which is simply means that we, we, we overlaid the population layer, the population distribution layer with the, the, the land use layer, and then simply looked at the, the population that had access to green areas and divided that with the total population of the city, and that is the score of the uh, urban green space indicator. We made this case study in Malmö, which is close to where I live, and uh, we know that in Malmö there is an uneven access to green areas. You see we have a few areas here and there, but it's pretty unevenly distributed and uh, availability is below Swedish average. And we looked at different sizes and different distances, etc. And you can see that within 300 meters, 31% of the Malmö population has access to green areas of a size of five hectares. One hectare is like a... Uh, soccer lawn. <coughs> yeah. And uh, case studies were also made in Utrecht in the Netherlands and in Kaunas in Lithuania. And um, it's not that interesting, <laughs> I would say, because, because it's pretty similar and uh, one could think that Sweden is fantastic and we always have the best amount of green areas because we are a very green country. Uh, the indicator scores for a small green area of only uh, 0 0.25 hectares is uh, like 70% in Malmö and it's almost the same in Utrecht and Kaunas. However, in Utrecht and Kaunas, uh, when it comes to the larger areas of green, it's a higher proportion of the city's population that has access to that as compared to Malmö. Mm. It is a very simple and rough measurement. Five minutes, thanks. Uh, yeah, it will also be included, access to green spaces will also be included in sustainable development goals. Uh, again, it's pretty fascinating, I think, that it is recognized the health benefits of accessibility to green urban areas. For the WHO work, they're mostly talking about the physical activity and the stress effects of the green spaces. So that is what they recognize. Yeah, I'm trying to come to what could be done in the future. No one really knows why humans do what they do. And that is interesting because we have this uh, less rational mindset than we might sometimes think. And the behavior is quite a lot affected by automatic uh, input and external input that we can't see. Uh, climate change, the value action gap and behavioral triggers. I spoke with Cindy Cheng yesterday and she is looking at, at uh, how people their awareness of climate change and how they actually act and that there might be a discrepancy in this. 
One could, for example, speculate uh, that uh, since we know that our, our automatic mind plays a big role in how we behave, there could be that one of the, the external determinants of behavior could be natural environments, which could potentially trigger uh, a more, uh, not only a healthy, healthy uh, behavior, but also a sustainable behavior, which would then increase the health in a population. For example, a few studies have demonstrated that uh, being exposed to green, being exposed to nature, increases uh, pro-social behavior like altruism and benevolence, etc. Uh, this year's bestseller will obviously be the Oxford textbook of nature and public health. Uh, I'm currently editing this one, and we have a good lineup of world well-known uh, authors, not the least Cecil Conanendake, of course, a uh, very famous man. Thanks for your attention. So thank you very much, Matilda. That's thank you, John. A really interesting presentation. Thanks. Uh, there seems to be lots and lots of different strands. And yes, there is. <laughs> there uh, is. I think it's all beginning to come together. Yeah, uh, hopefully. hopefully. In your new book. Yes, that, that is the idea. Yes, we hope to bring it together there. So can I throw it open to questions? Dave Patrick, director of the school. Thank you very much for bringing this here. Last summer I was involved in a petition to stop logging on an island just off the city in the mouth of Howe Sound. You would have driven by it on the way to Whistler. And I thought I might be blowing it out my ear because I was talking about the health benefits of people getting out to yeah. unbridled nature. So it's nice to see that there's work going on. My question um, is really around where you draw the intersect between green and planning, especially in the North American context. Hmm. Since World War II, we've been building suburbs everywhere. A fair amount of green, mostly private gardens, but people are getting places by car, and they look like pears on average. Yeah. Um, uh, so so, so, so where, do you, where does this research come together with the planning research? Are there ways of getting to green that are better than others? That is a very good question because what we struggle with is, of course, the call for densification and decreasing this suburban sprawl, etc., because it's not good for the environment, obviously, to, that everyone sits in the cars and it's not good for the sanitary behaviors. That is a challenge, indeed, and that is where we need to be innovative and looking at, for example, green walls and green roofs, etc., to get at least the visual impression of, of green, but we don't get the physical activity. We get ecosystem services to some extent. Um, that is still to be still to be worked on, I think. But uh, for, for, from my point of view, uh, one way is, of course, to collaborate across the urban planners and the health professionals. And if we get a higher recognition, uh, I'm pretty optimistic that we will uh, increase our ways to be innovative and to kind of combine the call for densification and also the call for healthy green environments. I am an urban planner. I'm yeah. wondering, um, we did a study in 2013 on the benefits of urban parks, and then the last bit we looked at the size of parks and people's access. From a planning perspective, it would be interesting to know, do you see a certain size of urban park or features of parks that you need to bring in, or what is beneficial? Thanks for that question, because I... Uh discussed quite a lot with my colleagues at WHO in Bonn, Europe, uh, because there is no scientific consensus regarding size nor distance. We can't say that the cutoff point is 300 meters. Finally, we had to be pragmatic, and we defined that the healthy environment, uh, the healthy distance would be 300 meters, which should correspond to five minutes walk. And the healthy size would be one hectare, because that would provide at least some opportunities for physical activity. But there is no scientific consensus regarding this. I also want to say that, as I said, this is a rough measurement. And uh, it is done in the way that it is supposed to be possible to apply it on a municipality level. And we are, uh, have made kind of a very detailed tool to be able to use this for, with also very small level of GIS knowledge. So we are using simply the linear distance, which does not always correspond to the walking distance. However, if you take 300 meters, it, the average would actually be 500 meters, still reasonably close. They have standards for this already in UK at something called Angst. And there they actually use uh, 
modifying factor of 1.6, I think. So you increase the, 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 the linear distance with 1.6. Usually, what has been praxis is to say 300 meters. Thank you. As a public health person, I ask, what do you see as the role of public health people in all of this? Instead, do we need doctors? Mm -hmm. I wonder if by extension you could say, do we need public health? Because again, the public health service is a service provider. <coughs> because the, much of what you're speaking about, the urban planning or political will or financial issues, uh, rather than things that the health system of any sort, including public health, will do. So other than advocating, what can we as public health people do? I think, uh, I mean, I think personally I see it as a little bit of a revolution, to be honest. I think a kind of paradigm shift is needed um, to to kind of increase the minds of the yes I talk about politicians and policies the public health policies as public health workers I think we uh, might need to increase the awareness of the the importance of uh, urban planning of landscape planning I think more knowledge is needed for public health workers and I said this thing is just a tiny little bit of all the work we need to do in public health so if some of us do that, uh, I think a lot of other things uh, are needed for doctors, for public health workers. Uh, but you, you stressed uh, the relationship between men and nature, uh, the physical nature. I was wondering uh, if there are any studies in terms of the interaction between doctor and patient uh, and the way, for example, doctors uh, describe more the disease a person has. Yeah, yeah, true. No, I, I'm not aware of any studies on this, though I believe it's a very interesting point. Uh, we know, though, that communication from doctor to patient uh, does not have a huge effect on the health behavior. It does not have a, it, it usually has an effect, an immediate effect on, on the behavior of the patient, but it's not sustainable. So the lifestyle behavior doesn't really get much better by information and neither by, by campaigns, etc. So again, if we can kind of make something about that interaction between people and people and uh, to, to look at the, the environment where that happens, it's an interesting thing, but I'm not aware of any current studies on that. Thanks. So that many of the studies that have been done, and some of the studies that we showed have been done by medical professionals or population health professionals. Rather, yes. And a lot of the studies have shown no effect or insignificant effects. But when you look at it from my perspective, I come from forestry, they're looking at a correlation with green space, and they don't make any attempt to find what that green space is very often. No. It could be astroturf, mm. it could be lawns, Indeed. it could be old growth forests. Yeah. Do you think that some of that noise and some of the studies that have shown no effect might be because of differences in the nature of the green, I instead of just calling it a green block? Yeah, exactly. This, what I said, this nature thing, what is that? I do indeed think so, and that is another reason for why I think it's important that we continue studying this and continue doing the research, uh, because I think it's enough that there are suggestions, there are indications from these pretty rough definitions that still has some kind of effect which is even recognized today. But for sure, the noise uh, is important to consider. And, and we are, for example, also planning in these VR studies to look at um, kind of doing exactly the same environments and then just changing small different items of the environment. Like, for example, a very simple thing to change, to take an urban, ordinary built environment and include uh, street trees and take those away and, and put in a, a water stream and take that away and then just look at the built environment, for example. Yeah, those are things we could do.
for sure, that matters. The amenities and the facilities do matter. Interestingly enough, it's not yet published, but there is a study going on in Gothenburg in Sweden where they look at uh, woodlands and forests and parks and compare not really the health benefits, but the perception, the feelings of the people and the place attachment, where, it's, where they have found that the place attachment, the uh, innate feeling for, for the area, for the environment, is not really significant for the public parks, though it is for, for, the, for the woodlands and the forests. So there is indeed a difference there, sure. Um, at, the, at the school, we've also been taking a big look at global burden of disease, and in previous discussions in this room, I think there was a lot of consensus that we're worried about the chronic diseases. Um, they, we're very interested in the, uh, the activity, the diet, uh, you know, the physical things that might, uh, might move things along there. And people have moved beyond individual advice to patients and say we need to engineer the social environment a little mm. bit because we're social animals and we don't behave in, um, in isolation. So thank you for bringing the mental health thing uh, back into the middle of it. Um, when we take a look at the coronary disease and the cancer and the, uh, the other outcomes that we're worried about, we often reinforce the argument with very large scale population ecological data. And what I'm wondering is whether, that, whether we have that yet and by way of uh, incidence of schizophrenia, depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, um, at population level. Um, uh, reflecting some of these environmental parameters that you're talking about. Does that exist yet, or is that work for our next crop of PhD? <laughs> Indeed, it works for the next crop. Of, uh, the, the difference between urban and rural population, there we have this prevalence incidence data, which is pretty straightforward, yeah. clear significance for the higher levels of bipolar and schizophrenia and depression in cities um, by pain. Payne is a Dutch uh, and his colleagues, for example, and there are several others, as you know. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if that answers your question. No. I'm just wondering, you know, with, with GPT, uh, people took a look at incidents of main indicators worldwide. That's yes. Not just an individual study. I'm, I'm wondering if we've, we've gone there yet with the, with the mental illness and the environment. Probably not yet. No, I wouldn't say. Still work to do. Right. And is there a trend? Is it just starting to get symbols that all the different metrics add up to something huh. financially that you could have or just because In my dreams there are. <laughs> <laughs> in my dreams, indeed, I've been looking uh, for health economists. I got happy when I talked to Michael Brower before that you have quite a good stuff, of course, of health economists here. Um, there are a few tiny reports rather than studies on these things, again, from UK, where I think they are a little bit proactive, actually, in the terms of the environmental impact on health. Um, I have no figures yet or in my head they are of course because those are made by people who believe in these things so they show cost uh, uh, efficiency by providing uh, green environments um, there is of course in uk again a group with joe nurse and her colleagues who have been looking at uh, at uh, cost efficiency of uh, public health actions where the green healthy environments are included but that is an entity, so it's not separated from the others. So uh, that is a very interesting area that I would love to study. Thanks. One last question. In the same week, we have um, some coffee, uh, probably donuts, which is probably <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you should have had flowers. <laughs>
it was in a bunker in the engineering department, so there were exactly these kind of sounds from pipes, etc. No, uh, it was a tiny little pilot study, so uh, we did not really control for that more than that it was present in all three groups. Yeah. No. Thanks. It's interesting as well because most of the studies have been looking at, the experimental studies have been looking at the visual impact, looking at video films and photographs, etc. And I definitely think that the other sensory dimensions like sound and smell, I believe, and tactile dimensions as well, they big grow. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so it's the first time we've tried a Joint Forestry School of Population and Public Health uh, seminar. Uh, in the UK, they seem to be far more ahead. So the, one of the leading players in the UK in this whole field of um, population health is the Forestry Commission. Because mm. they are the main providers of green recreation studies. Mm. And we would love True. to see something similar happening here uh, in Vancouver. We know that the biggest problem, the, the budget of the province is and um, maybe this is one way we could maybe help the province reduce some of their expenditures. That's the idea. <laughs> getting a healthier population. And Vancouver seems to be the, one of the best places in the world that we could do that, given our natural propensity to have an outdoor lifestyle. Yeah. You're and probably low rates of things like diabetes and obesity compared to the rest of Canada here in Vancouver. So thank you very much for coming and thank you, thank Matilda. You. Thank you. Thank you.